Hi, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Tech Recruitment Podcast. My guest today is uh, someone special, someone who has been in the tech recruitment industry really dedicated. So um, my guest's name is uh, Yuma Haimons. He's the co-founder of HeroHunt.ai, which is a real-time search engine for tech talent. And Yuma has uh, set up the company with uh, a co-founder, uh, Lucian Simo. Um, Yuma has uh, a background in uh, talent analytics solutions. He has uh, built software as a service companies before. And uh, just recently, as I mentioned, uh, co-founded Hero Hunt, uh, which is also something we will talk about today. So how to find developers, how to interpret their profiles. So before we dive deeper, Yuma, uh, why didn't you tell us uh, why did you start the Hero Hunt? Uh, what was uh, your motivation? So the motivation to start Hero Hunt.ai is that we see in the talent recruitment industry that there's basically one leading a single platform actually where recruiters especially rely on and tech companies in general. And that's LinkedIn, obviously. So we all know LinkedIn, but we also are all quite dependent on LinkedIn as a platform. And we also saw all those kinds of different spots or sources of information where candidates could be found. So like for an example, a GitHub Stack Overflow. So that's where the ID of a real-time search engine uh, arose uh, to actually search those platforms and find the best candidate profiles and their information to actually have an accurate picture of what candidates can actually do. And we started off, my co-founder, Lucien Simo and myself, um, with building a job platform. So a job board, like the typical classical job board business model that's already existing from 1995 up till now. And we actually saw that it is fulfilling a very important need for startups and scale-ups, which was our target group. But the idea of a job board was already done in the industry quite a lot of times before. And the job board ID is very dependent on two sides of the marketplace, right? Growing the candidate base and growing your customer base, which are, are recruiters and tech companies who have jobs on there. But we realized that all that information that we were actually giving to the tech recruiters was already online, available in public profiles that were actually intended for, for professional purposes. And that's where the idea of a talent search engine came from um, in combination with the trend of passive candidate sourcing, right? Tech companies who actually have to chase candidates instead of candidates coming to the tech companies themselves to offer themselves and apply for a job. It now has kind of turned around. And we saw the biggest gap there also in the market, not really filling that gap yet in terms of tools that you can use for passive candidate sourcing that actually work. So that's where we developed the idea and also the concept and the prototype of a real-time search engine. And that's where we are today, actually tech recruiters using AI to find the best candidates across those platforms mentioned. So LinkedIn, GitHub, Stack Overflow, we're adding more. And uh, the added benefit there is that, or what we get to you to hear a lot is that a lot of recruiters like that it's a product specifically for tech companies, made for tech companies where LinkedIn, for an example, has to be able to find a nurse on the one hand, but also a software engineer, which are essentially different profiles um, as you know, as a tech recruiter yourself. Um, so that's, yeah, wh what we do it for, actually, to fulfill that need that, um, that's been uh, missing there. And interesting that you mentioned the real-time aspect of, of the search, because um, some of the listeners may also perceive the um, LinkedIn platform or GitHub also as a real-time search, right? They just go there and they search in real time. So when you talk about your platform being real-time, what does it really mean? Like, how can people actually imagine this? Like, what is what is real-time for you and what is yeah. not, not real-time anymore? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. And that's also where the story can become a little bit technical, but I'll just explain it in the sim most simple way possible. So what we see in the market is that there are a lot of sourcing solutions, right? And they're basically just databases of CVs of people in there. So 
especially like a lot of American companies, they have a database of people, profiles, and they're based on, for example, scraping LinkedIn, scraping 550 million LinkedIn profiles. There are actually like companies making very big money out of that, just that, and making that accessible to other companies. And then there are all those other platforms as well, where all that candidate information lives and where actually the candidates live and produce information about what they like to do and what they're actually able to do. So being a real-time search engine means that, you know, at the same time that you start your search, we actually search those different platforms and we retrieve the, the candidate information at that point in time, instead of like retrieving information from a database that's already outdated and that you're just updating like every three or six months. So it's, it's the same uh, kind of information as uh, LinkedIn uh, would provide you in the LinkedIn recruiter account, for an example. Um, but we add information from other sources to actually have a richer picture of the candidate and be better able to make an accurate match based on the job description that the user uh, includes. Mm -hmm. And that's very cool. That's very cool because you enrich the data that is already on LinkedIn. Um, and um, do you also make it easier for fellow recruiters to find the right profiles? Um, you know, just to you know, to, to, to give you some background, like when we, for example, look for front-end developers, we usually need to enter front-end or front-end with space mm -hmm. or front-end with dash and yeah. then engineer or developer, you know? So we come up with all these different uh, Boolean combinations just because, I mean, it's not the limitation it, of, of the platform. It is what it is. That's what people enter on their profile. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it could be aggregated. But as you mentioned, yeah. LinkedIn cannot just do it for IT because they also have nurses and doctors mm -hmm. and all these other professions. So they need to just make it, you know, uh, very, very generic. So how, yeah. how do you solve this? How do you make it easier for recruiters? Yeah, good one. So we also have some experience ourselves actually in doing this because we recruited, we recruited for startups and scale-ups back when we had the job board. And we were like literally making search strings of like 30 synonyms just for the job title only, right? So for an example, a sales executive can have 30 synonyms um, on, for the job title alone, like a salesperson, a sales manager, an account executive, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we also see across the other roles that are relevant for tech companies. Like for an example, an engineer can be a coder, programmer, or developer. Um, but also for an example, AWS can be Amazon Web Services, right? Mm -hmm. And there are many, many examples, especially in the tech related uh, candidate sourcing space, which are re relevant to take into account. And exactly like you say, like LinkedIn doesn't take into account all those different synonyms because it's a highly generalized alg algorithm. What we built is a search engine that actually takes into account all the synonyms that are relevant for those tech roles. And so we have extended our library of those tech terms, but also we have a learning system that learns based on the different job description that are being inputted or inserted by the users. And based on that, we actually process and learn all those different tech related terms and can make the matches more and more optimized for that tech uh, candidate sourcing uh, mm. use case. Mm, very cool, very cool. And uh, also you just said that you've been doing recruitment before, or maybe you are still, still recruiting uh, for some clients uh, through the platform that you've built. So um, what, what's, your, what's your vision for recruitment? You know, you've been in the industry for some time. You try to, you know, uh, improve it with the product. So what's your overall vision? My vision is that the recruitment industry is significantly going to change in the, in, in the next decades because more and more information is be, uh, it becomes digitally available. So people produce products online, also with the remote working trend, more and more people are working online, producing information, all that information or a big part of that information is publicly available. Designers have their portfolio online, developers are sharing code openly and publicly on GitHub Stack Overflow, uh, sales executives might hear, let their voice be heard on Medium, for an example, 
data scientists are on Kaggle sharing code or data related. Um, so all that information is an extremely valuable source to make more sense out of who are people actually, what are they interested in, and not only looking at the LinkedIn profile, which is quite static, and a lot of people don't actually maintain it on a monthly or yearly or even decade basis. So my vision is that it's going to be a lot more based on richer information that's relevant, accurate, uh, uh, tells the true story about the candidate and that we will have a solution that is able to access that information and uh, let it uh, let users uh, make uh, more sense uh, out of it so they can actually also take action based on that information that makes sense instead of having outreach messages that are not targeted at all in the right way and with a very highly standardized uh, message. Uh, some generic Kant messages, right? And it's yeah. uh, interesting that you mentioned this uh, rich data. Um, so it's, it's great to have uh, more information about the developer, about the languages or tools they use. Um, but what some IT recruiters struggle with is actually interpreting the data they see or the information they, they see on the profiles or the resumes. They just look at all these keywords and they are like, oh my God, like what is relevant? What is important in this particular case? What is not? What is already outdated? And they see 20, 30 keywords and they don't really know what, what is what is important. Do you have yeah. for, for, for fellow recruiters any tip on how to tackle this? You know, what to start with, how not to get overwhelmed, overwhelmed with all these uh, IT um, abbreviations and uh, some of these keywords? Yeah, yeah. And and it is hard, right? It is very complex. It's, it's a very steep learning curve, I have to say. That's also why you, for an example, have your uh, pamphlets with, uh, with the keywords, for an example, and the expla explanations, right? Uh, with what they actually mean. So that's, that's a very important, I think, education and awareness step also for, especially for tech recruiters who are active in the industry. Um, what, what I think is a very nice first step is to check out like let's say a hundred profiles on a different platform than you're actually used to, and then try to make sense out of that. So understand how the platform is being used. If we take, for an example, a stack overflow, you have to know that engineers go there to answer, to ask and ask, answer questions related to writing code. So engineers come together at like a collaboration community, and they help each other out with just answering their questions that they might have in, okay, how to build this snippet of code or how to build an entire library or how to use a library uh, in my current uh, code base. And they help, they're help. they helping each other out. And that's also why it's a valuable source of information because they're actually producing information about what they're actually doing instead of what they have put on their LinkedIn profile 10 years ago. So I would say start out in checking those profiles, see what's happening on there. And also realize that it's not only you that's on that platform, it's not, it's not your recruitment platform, that place. It, it wasn't designed like that. It's designed for engineers to actually share information with each other and help each other out. So also know your place there, I would say, and uh, only make use of public information there. Um, don't go like make use of a leaked Facebook database because you are desperate to get a, an email address because that's really not appreciated, obviously. But a lot of engineers actually are open to outreach uh, and they will also indicate and they will share their contact details if they are. Um, so make use of the information that's available publicly um, and then just experiment and make make use of the uh, information there is and know that it's uh, a steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. Well. It, it just reminds me how important the uh, curiosity is, right? You mentioned to visit a few dozens or a hundred profiles. You know, someone just really needs to be curious about uh, visiting these profiles and, and just try to understand what is on those profiles, which, um, you know, after fifth or sixth profile may get a little boring right, or tiring. But uh, I guess after these uh, few dozens or a hundred profiles, some, you know, dots start connecting in, in, in a brain, right? So, um. I guess yeah. what it takes also is some perseverance or, or grit in this sense, you know, not, not to give up after five profiles, but to complete the circle with a few dozens or 100 could be a great benchmark, you know, to, to go exactly. through 100 profiles and then you will really understand how does the platform actually work, whether it is Tech Overflow or GitHub. 
hundred percent. Yeah, and I would say challenge yourself as well. Like have a day in a week, for an example, for the upcoming month. Every day you're going to have a day in a week that you're not opening LinkedIn at all. That's the rule. And you are only looking at other profiles, other platforms, other sources of information. And you force yourself to be creative and get out of your comfort zone with LinkedIn and get out of your mindset of reliance on a single platform. Because it's also a dangerous kind of market dynamic, right? You don't want to be reliant on one single platform, big tech company that's already owning almost the entire professional data space and is increasing prices and, you know, it's actually you on a leash as a tech recruiter. You don't want to be reliant on one party. You want to be flexible. You want to be creative in your working field. You want to have options. You don't mm-hmm. want to have uh, just one option. And this is such a such a uh, great idea for a challenge. One day without LinkedIn, that's uh, something I guess I'll also try. You know, just one day without. I mean, it's, it cannot be Saturday or Sunday, but that's without mm-hmm. LinkedIn anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so that doesn't count. It should be a work day without LinkedIn. I, I guess I guess we should have uh, that also for our academy members. I just wrote it down, not to forget. Uh, that's that's a great tip. And. Um, um okay cool cool and i'm i'm sure you collect uh, lots of uh, profiles about you know developers whatever is publicly available through uh github stack overflow uh, linkedin so so do you have any any insights about where the best developers are or is there anything that uh, you have already noticed while building up the database any interesting insight that you could share with uh, recruiters yeah so uh, we're we're searching through them real time, so it's not actually a database, and we're collecting information, but we're searching the information real time. But still, uh, a lot of information is obviously flowing through the search engine. So, what what we have noticed is that it's actually quite hard to look at software engineers and as one big population if you want to make sense out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, from a demand and supply perspective, for an example, which software engineers are really in demand and which are not. That's also really, really hard to say because what we have seen, what we have learned is that every software engineer, it's not just a Java engineer, or it's not just a front-end engineer, or it's not just a machine learning engineer. They always have a good mix of different technologies that they're interested in, that they're learning about, but also that they're actually able to code with. And that's, I think, the most important realization from the data that we have seen is that there's not one profile with one job title, it's a profile with many, many things and many information, uh, much information on the profile that comes from different places, again, uh, but also that represents one individual and not an entire group represented by a job title. Mm-hmm. That's interesting that you mentioned. It just reminds me with a fellow group of recruiters, we were talking about uh, a few profiles and um, you know, it comes with some gut feeling, right? When you go through so many profiles, then you can gauge where people are heading in their career. So, um, so, so it's it's an interesting insight. Like it's not just about where people are at today, but also where yeah. they may potentially be heading. So, what kind of technology to offer them? Like we have, for example, now one client who uses Elixir, and like really, how many? developers out there use Elixir, not that many, right? Compared to JavaScript or, or PHP or whatever. So we need to find those who are keen to learn Elixir, right? As, as a programming language um, and somehow offer them this, this opportunity as, as an exi- exciting one. So yeah. it's uh, yeah, great, great to think about it this way, as you mentioned. That's also what I love about the developer community, right? It's, it's a lot of sharing and it's a lot of open source. So it's a lot of showing the world or that niche community what you're all about. And that's also where yeah, the most interesting information is coming from. If you compare that, for an example, with the most personal branding approaches on a LinkedIn profile, which don't really represent reality. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's what I love about like engineers. They are actually all about the code and the love for the code and the passion for building something and showing that to the world, making it public, collaborating on it. Uh, instead of uh, necessarily presenting themselves in a certain way. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, true, true. Okay, so w- one way to get candidates is through uh, through LinkedIn, Stack Overflow, Hero Hunt, uh, AI, or some other platform. That's the kind of uh, 
active outreach to candidates. Is there is there some other strategy like I don't know job boards or something that you've been using with uh, some success within the particular IT segment? I think um, there are definitely some hacks you could say that you could use, uh, tricks that you could apply. Um, I would say the most important source of candidates for the tech com companies is and is going to be uh, passive candidate sourcing. Uh, what what we have learned from job boards is that like the best candidates are very hard to find on a job board because they're not going to actively apply for something because they already get so much outreach and also quality outreach from uh, companies that provide and remote benefits and uh, a lot of holidays and very high salary. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite hard to find the best actual candidates on job boards, that's our belief. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities to make better use of data. So that's, that's what we also build the company around is that the data quality is just, yeah, very low in terms of what is already being used. If you look at, for an example, at your current ATS, so if you use your ATS system, you probably look at it and you think, okay, I have an email address, I have a name, I have some notes that I made about the candidates and some touch points in the funnel, but where's all the data about their background? Where's all the data about their skills, about what they've been doing, what they like, what their personality is like? I think there's the biggest kind of opportunity for the recruitment industry to better understand someone because that's in the end all about what you, what your role is all about is understanding someone better and then making the translation to what actually could be a good job for them to do and, and uh, be uh, and emphasize with that um so that better understanding that that starts with having the information in the first place right you can't uh, judge a book by its cover i see a lot of books behind you i know some so I know also the content. So I, then I can judge uh, about uh, what it's about. But a lot of them I don't know. And, and I first have to open it and see, uh, turn all the pages and re actually read them before I can actually make a good judgment about it. So it's the, the exact same in the recruitment industry. Why are we still like using human beings as data points represented by an email address and a name? Uh, mm. we, we don't really understand it. So that's where the biggest opportunity is, uh, if you ask us. And that's also where we're providing that information from all those different sources, but also trying to enrich those profiles so you can actually make sense out of them. Mm -hmm. True, true. Good, good that you mentioned this. It just reminded me uh, the other day I was talking to a developer. Uh, we were talking about two different uh, positions that could be a good fit for him, like a front-end React developer. So like lots of companies look for these developers, right? But there are two that uh, are like two of our clients. One is the kind of corporate environment or the well-developed, established 50 developers on the team. And the other is the startup uh, with uh, just an MVP and uh, funding. And I was just mm -hmm. talking to this developer, like which one of these two is more appealing to him? And I was like, oh, I don't want the established, you know, it's just too boring. Everything is already set up. I want to work for the company that is starting on a greenfield, funded, you know, that would be my sweet spot. Yeah. And, and it just reminded me now when you talked about the ATS, I haven't really noted it down in the ATS. I just remember it, uh, but in two weeks I will forget. So um, um, like this kind of preference to a specific company type or, or a project type, like that would be certainly invaluable. But coming back to your, your example with marketing, which is much more developed, like a lot of these tracking happens automatically through, mm -hmm. through I don't know, some tagging in an e-shop, you know, so based on what product do you visit, uh, you get yeah. tagged in the system. But now, how would you apply similar concepts in, in recruitment? Because you just discover it manually while talking to people. And then, you know, like, it's just so cumbersome to write it down somehow manually. I mean, we could yeah. do it now when we talk about it, really, like have one field in the ATS um, interested in some kind of business but yeah just i'm trying to to understand like how can we all make it work not just us particularly but fellow recruiters listening to this yeah definitely so i think that's a great question and that's a great starting question as well i think as a recruiter you know if you look at your ats and you only see an email address and, and a first name and a job title that they usually have then you should be wondering okay where's the rest of the information 
So I think there are two things indeed. So there's like an automated way to enrich that data. So get, for example, the fit data or the matching data about that candidate, right? Because that's that's also in in, in the benefit of the candidates for you to actually understand who you're talking to, because that prevents also a lot of frustration in the in the rest of the process, where there's a lot of transitions and other people getting involved and you know you having as a candidate having to answer the same questions over and over again. So that kind of basic information about the candidate that's already available and that you should have that in your ATS system. So you should have that somewhere available. Um, I hope you're not using an Excel sheet anymore, but I hope you're using an ATS, something that's like for that purpose. And there are plenty of ways to actually enrich that information. We're talking about demographics, so people data, and that's about the candidate themselves. So think about job title for an example, but also think about the headline, the description, think about the most important keywords on their profile. And that's also where you can use AI system to calculate that for you. What are the top skills of the candidate for an example? That, that's also something that Herohan.ai, for example, does, but also other solutions in the market. That's the demographics. But then there are also firmographics. So think about the data about the companies that the candidate has worked with. So for example, a backend engineer that has worked for Google, Amazon, Microsoft, those companies all have information about what kind of companies are they. So industry, for an example, it's an in the internet related industry. So if he has three companies that's internet related, that's also might also say something about their career path um, and has some prediction strength uh, and a probability that they will uh, look for something new in the internet industry as well. They might always have the opportunity to like go do entirely something else, work on, on an island with their hands, for an example. That's always a, a chance, but it's a smaller chance. Um, so get that data in your system. There are plenty of ways of doing that. Um, we have uh, a solution for that, uh, but other uh, companies as well to enrich that data, get a full view. And the, the next moment that you're looking at your ATS, you're actually looking at the people instead of their names uh, and the people and their background and their learnings and the skills instead of only as, at their names and their profile picture. Mm -hmm. Very cool, very cool. And also the, the past company, it also reminded me uh, another client who was looking for a CTO and they were like, well, we need someone who was a CTO before in a company of at least like 200 to 500 people, not too large company. You know, they don't want someone from like IBM or some of these companies, uh, not too small company. So in, in a company of 10 people, that would not be a, a fit anymore. So like we were going through these candidates one by one, opening up those past companies where they work with on LinkedIn, just to see how many employees those companies have roughly. You can see. Yeah connected uh, with them uh, but uh, but now when you mention it it would be so valuable to have a tool that uh, can just give you all these uh, on, on a golden plate instead of going through all these profiles and open up their past companies so, yeah. uh, so if, if uh, this is something you have in the tool then uh, that will be a golden golden source yeah it is it, the difference of, of like having the opportunity to just jump into whatever their, the candidate is about and what, what's happening in the life and, and the difference and the, on the other side, just looking at static information without having a, a picture, you know, mm. of who, who they actually are. And that also doesn't trigger anything. It doesn't trigger anything if you don't have that picture in front of you um, to, to do any best action that you have, to do any next steps. So you will just look at it like empty and yeah, it doesn't, doesn't motivate you to do uh, something that's uh, that that will move things forward so um, yeah it's it's a big opportunity yeah yeah well and then at some point it recruitment will be easy hopefully right when uh, yeah. there are all these tools available you just go there click someone who was a cto three years ago in a company of 300 to 500 people even someone with digital content experience and then you know, you push two buttons and then the platform would connect automatically. But then do we actually even need IT recruiters? So uh, I'm not sure like if that's aligned with your vision. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I think uh, IT recruiters will, especially for the next decades, will, will exist 
still. Uh, I think, like you said, um, like touch points in funnel, for an example, that you are inputting manually in the ATS, that's a perfect example where you as a human in the process are still very, very valuable because you're on the one side, of course, facilitating the process for the candidate. Not everything is automated and it's not like a just a digit going to, through a system, it's a person. Um, but also understanding, I think that's the biggest, like human intelligence is not gonna be even, or uh, machine intelligence is not gonna be even close to human intelligence in the next decades. Everybody's talking about generalized AI, for an example, like robots doing exactly what humans do. But in reality, it's always a dedicated system, a specialized system, doing one thing and doing one thing and doing that in a really smart and automated way. And that's actually where AI is also the most valuable up till now. And it will also be in the near future, at least it's, it's doing specialized tasks like finding people, like um, enriching data, those kind of things. And you as a human have the context of it all and understand where a candidate is and what they actually should do next or how you can assist them in uh, facilitating that next step uh, and understanding them and capturing that information and sharing that information while having conversations with hiring managers, for an example, um, of your understanding of that candidate. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. So now when we extrapolate what's happening on the market with uh, regards to candidate being um, candidates being overwhelmed with all these opportunities, as you mentioned, they receive lots of messages every day or every week. Also, you know, the AI automation and uh, software being built as we speak, like where, where all this is heading, like what's, what's next in IT recruitment? What can we look forward to in the next uh, few years? Yeah, I think there are two, two, two big changes. So, from from a candidate perspective and i'd like to start with that is that it's gonna be more digital so i'm I'm talking my reference is tech companies right so uh, my reference is not nurses and uh bar uh personal for an example or, or any other like construction workers or any uh, other things like that what, what i know well is the tech company space so that's my reference just to be clear about that and the tech company space like if you're a tech candidate then you should realize that a lot of the sourcing and the, a lot of the validation of your of you as a candidate is being done online. And um, so that means that having your information up to date on your different social media platforms is really, really helpful in getting you a next opportunity that you would love to do. So just um, spending one day, for an example, keeping your LinkedIn profile up to date that's extremely important in for you to get your next opportunity getting handed to you instead of you have to uh, having to get after it. So that's from a candidate perspective. And um, what I think from a recruiter perspective will change is that recruiters will realize that LinkedIn is just only one platform, that LinkedIn's data is publicly available. So also for other companies to use. That's why it's public information. It's uh, also with the user intent of being public information. So it's not LinkedIn's data, even though they sometimes try to protect it that way uh, with commercial purposes, obviously. But it's it's public data, so everybody can use it. So also realize that other solutions are making that information available um, in a different kind of setup, uh, maybe a more user-friendly setup, for example. Um, and you will, as a recruiter, be uh, enriched with more information in an automated way from different angles. If you are curious enough to explore different tools that actually work for you, and if you ask enough uh, questions, I would say if you have an ATS, for an example, that doesn't allow for a lot of um, information adding or rich, rich data or automated uh, processes, then I would uh, ask yourself why you're using that ATS, for an example, um, and the same for a sourcing tool, um, because there are so much more available in the market. And that's actually also what makes your job a lot more fun, is exploring those different tools, experimenting with it. A lot of those are free trials, so you don't have to worry about credit cards being charged or asking your boss or anything like that. Just experiment, 
and try it out and see where it is uh, yeah, where where it is heading to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like all these tools, sometimes it's easy to get lost uh, with all these tools and all these free trials. But uh, the the uh, curiosity that uh, you mentioned could be also priceless in this sense. Like explore what are the tools, how they can help you as a recruiter. And uh, one of the one of the tools uh, to experiment with could be um, Hero Hunt AI, right? So, um, so where, where can where can people uh, you know learn more about this tool? Uh, can they go to the website directly and sign up for some free trial, or how, how they can learn more about uh, your company and and yourself as well? Yeah, yeah, sure. So definitely check out my social media channels. Uh, you're always welcome to connect. Um, I'm very happy to connect with tech recruiters in the space. So uh, feel free to do that. Um, our website is herohunt.ai. So that's also our name, but that's also our website. So that's an easy one. It's one word, herohunt.ai. And there you can also, uh, there you have a button in the right corner and that's a free trial. So you can just use it, try it, see if it's something for you that's interesting enough. And uh, we're also always happy to uh, jump on a call, a demo, uh, to give a demo, answer questions, uh, answer your re requests. So feel free uh, to reach out. We're also continuously learning. I think that's also important to say as like an, a relatively early stage company, we're continuously learning from the industry where it's heading to and how people are using tools and what they don't like as well. So um, we are also very have open for feedback and learnings. So um, that's also why we're very open to uh, get into a conversation uh, with the tech recruiter. Very cool, very cool. So uh, coming back to the... Uh... A one day challenge without LinkedIn, it could be with herohunt.ai, right? It's yes, uh, for example, push, right? you could use that as an alternative. <laughs> yeah, that, that might be a nice challenge to just use herohunt.ai for one day and see if that works. Um, oh, and, and also use it aside of manually using Stack Overflow on GitHub, and you also get to know those platforms. So, um, yeah, just mm. be uh, experimental, uh, it will bring you a lot. Cool, cool, wonderful. All right, cool, cool. So uh, thanks, thanks a lot for joining uh, this uh, this podcast. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, thanks for sharing all your insights, and I'll share the link to your LinkedIn profile um, in the show notes, so uh, people can connect with you and also uh, visit uh, herohunt.ai. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, and I uh, I love what you're doing. It's a uh, it's an, a very good step in uh, towards. Uh, more awareness uh, in the tech recruiting space. So also thanks for that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye.